Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. With your hosts, Lonnie Lowry. Remember, Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree held together with scar tissue and bone spurs. Rob Fortney. And I'm telling you, the pain that I would suffer was ex- beyond excruciating. And Phil Stevens. Do it, Rob. You'll kill all those nerves. Thanks for listening. Welcome, Iron Radio listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry. I'm an exercise physiologist, and I'm a real nutritionist, and I'm a former competitive bodybuilder. Yeah, this is Phil Stevens. I'm a coach, strength yield. I powerless to do Highland Games and much other stuff. Hey, it's Dr. Mike T. Nelson, owner of Extreme Human Performance, a uh, faculty member at the Kerrig Institute for Functional Neurology, and uh, even though my final submitted for grades this tomorrow actually <laughs> <laughs> it's all a blur that, that time once again <laughs> right no there's no doubt this is definitely the time all the you know professors that i know are ramping up for fall semester you know like yep. everything starts the shit hits the fan next week and okay here we go you know. yep buckle in uh, um okay today we are going to talk about uh appetite manipulation for gain and loss in the topic of the day Let's get that out there. Uh, this was based in part on an article that Joe Shalero, who was recently on the show, he sent me uh, on orexins. Uh, sort of think of like a brain hormones, if you will, uh, neuropeptides, what have you, that stimulate eating, right? So uh, there's more to it than that. There's lots of things that control your appetite and your hunger. These are different things. Uh, and we'll talk about it in the second half of the show, like for gains and loss. Let's start with our um, mail, and then we'll get to news. This first bit of mail, I think, is almost tailored to you, Dr. Nelson. This is from Scott. Uh, I enjoyed episode 402 in the interview with Dr. Brian Mann on velocity-based training. However, as a basement dweller, I cannot afford a $2,000 gym-aware unit. I'd be interested to hear you got your guys' thoughts on the accelerometer-based bar speed devices hitting the market like beast or push and then he gives a link here Um, at a tenth of the price about two hundred dollars i picked up one out of curiosity having the data during sets is fun another way to aim for a high score without added added weight punishing my joints Uh, the measurements seem consistent within the exercise but i do wonder how accurate they could be an interview with one of the engineers who developed the technology or the algorithms could be interesting Deciding which movements count must be tricky. Keep up the great work. I listen to every episode. Regards, Scott. All right, uh, Dr. Nelson. So thoughts on what's on the market, you know, their variability, you know, best movements to use them in, whatever. Yeah, there's a bunch of different devices on the market now. There's Push Beast, I think Open Barbell. Uh, there's probably a couple others I'm I'm missing now too. There's a couple others that were supposed to have been out. I don't think ever even made it either. Um, I've used a push device since uh, the beta testing versions. So I had one of the early versions of that and met with the guys when we were up in Toronto a couple times. And um, I like it. I think it's gotten infinitely better than the original versions that they had. Um, there is some data on that one that shows it appears to be pretty accurate. But I know that was one of the big questions I had from initially when I was up there. And they spent a lot of time testing it uh, against force plates and everything else like that. Um, I have noticed that up until recently, it seems to be pretty good now that for some of the rep counting, like on deadlifts, like if you stopped at the bottom and then would go again. So like I usually do most of mine with a slight pause at the bottom, um, not really doing continuous reps. Stuff like that would sometimes kind of hose up the counting a little bit. There was a manual thing after it, so you could, you know, adjust it so the numbers were still correct. Uh, From what I've heard, I haven't used, I think it's the open barbell, that that one's a little bit better for squat bench and deadlift, I believe. Um, So I guess it depends on what you're using it for. Um, What I found it was super useful for was the more, I guess you'd say velocity-based stuff. Right, so even if you're doing deadlifts and you're doing like more emphasis on a lighter weight and actual speed, it's super easy then to do like uh, Brian Mann had talked about too, like an auto-regulation type thing. So sometimes I'll just go until 
my speed drops off and then I'm like, all right, that was this, you know, max for that day. So maybe two sets some days and <clears throat> eight sets some other days. So you're kind of maximizing what you can do that day. Um, the other part too, and I know uh, Dr. Mann talked about this, is that the relationship between velocity <clears throat> and even stuff like one rep max for most things is pretty good. <clears throat> so you can use velocity as a, a relatively accurate marker for where about your one rep max would be. And again, there's going to be some variability in there too because we've all seen some people's one rep max and it's pretty speedy and other people's it's like like snail slow. So there's some variability there, but you can you know kind of go through and figure that out on yourself relatively quickly. And then the last thing I use it for is if I'm doing you know just some type of power clean or something like that. I don't do a lot of Olympic lifting. I'm not very good at it at all. But what I've noticed with that is I'll give myself basically one extra set. So if I'm just doing doubles, um, if I have one set where the speed kind of dropped down, since I know I'm not very good at that movement. If I can't correct for it on the next set, then I'll say that I'm done on that exercise. Um, or if it's something more like a deadlift or you're a little bit more proficient and I've done it enough, I've got a pretty good history, eh, probably we'll just, as soon as the initial speed drops, I'm probably gonna call it at that point. So, so I'd say it depends on what you're you know, looking to use it for. I haven't used it for all of their exercises or any sort of kind of classic bodybuilding type stuff because I think it gets to be kind of a little bit of a pain there. Uh, but I found it super useful for, you know, some Olympic lifts if you're in doing some speed stuff also. And as you mentioned, too, I know on the push device now, uh, you can have the display up like on an iPad and it'll show you the information live. So after each rep, you kind of get that nice feedback to see where you're going to, which I found to be super helpful. The initial version, you'd have to hit it at the end and would kind of go through and tell you and that was OK for your next set. But. I found that having the the live feedback was pretty useful. That's a part that looks fun to me, like that. It's a biofeedback kind of thing, but with yeah. the performance instead of, I don't know, pain or whatever else that, that gets used for. But If I was doing uh, cleans, and I would see right away after I, you know, because I'd do a pause between each one, maybe I'm doing triples at a lighter weight, and go, oh, that one wasn't as fast. Okay, so what what should I try to do? Did I think I did something funny there? and see if I can correct for it on the next one. Ah, I could correct for it on the next one. So for someone like me who's not very good at those lifts, I think it's a good way of giving you an external uh, focused feedback. Um, so then you can kind of change things around a little bit instead of, oh yeah, I did a whole bunch of sets and I don't really know which ones are better and which ones were worse. Gotcha. Yep. That's the benefit with the Tendo. Is the yeah, audible, exactly. The audible beep it gave. You know, yep. like you didn't even have to look at it. It would talk to you. You know, you slowed down. Uh oh. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. So, with the cheapness, yeah. relative cheapness, like Phil, can you see yourself using these a little bit in the gym, or do you just like to rely on more like subjective coaching cues? Is it worth it to you personally, or? No, I think they're handy for some athletes. Um, it definitely gives another. Especially for the sport athletes and things like that, or even people that don't have a lot of, uh, oh, internal drive. It mm -hmm. gives them something external. Like, you need to beat that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. They now have something aside from themselves to compete against. Like, you see that number? You need to get higher than that. Um, and consistently stay there as long as you can. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's helpful. Okay. And it doesn't make the coach, quote, unquote, the bad person either. You know, because yeah. it gets you out of what I found out of the loop and say, hey, here's what the number is. Because, you know, otherwise it's like, well, that one looked a little slow. And they kind of look at you funny, you know, especially if they're new and they don't really have a lot of buy in. You're like, no, look at the number. See, see yeah. what's slow. Don't, yeah. don't yell at me. <laughs> right. Like it's subjective bias. Like you're just being hard on me, coach. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. As opposed to, well, the number is what it is, buddy. Yeah. You know, swallow yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think it's they're definitely adding an element of things. I, we had MC Powers on right uh, once or twice over the last few years, and I know some of the big universities are really buying in with huge yeah. systems for a whole team to be you know competing against each other with velocity based type stuff. It does, yeah, it does bring. It's one of those things that I think is cool about all this technology, you know, Fitbits and accelerometers and all the things that are are changing so much. You can track your sleep, you can track your performance, and you know, I really. 
we talked about this with MC, I think, but watch them to start to have everybody is so wired, for example, in the football field or the basketball court. You're gonna they're gonna be showing all kinds of more like physiologic stats during oh, games. Yeah. You know, like look at their heart rate on this team. It's you know, they seem to be really out of shape compared to the other team or I don't know, something like that. Yeah, and they're already doing that and that I the biggest problem and you're already starting to see it too is that and I get these questions sometimes too, is that you have all this data but then you tend to lose the context of it, mm-hmm. right? So even something simple like, okay, you have all this cool heart rate data. Well, what was the performance of the game? Yes. Like how yes. do you – yeah, I don't even care if the coach no. just sits there and qualitatively rates it. Like what, what the hell are you going to compare it to in a team sport? Oh, I can tell you they're more conditioned if their heart rate's lower, but maybe it was an easier game. Maybe they didn't try as hard. Maybe they lost by a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, no, you're right. It, tends to get lost. it comes down to the interpretation, having a commentator on there. You almost need like the, a science advisor or a coach or something to say, well, you know, you got to take that heart rate stuff with a grain of salt because maybe the team with the higher heart rate, they're not out of shape. They just, they all like to um, have energy drinks before the game. You know what I mean? It's not a fitness marker in that case. It's just a response to a stimulant. Yeah. So, or they're yeah. S- simply trying harder. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. 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 So. Okay, so good stuff. I think technology is always fun to discuss. It's just one of the things that's going to change the way people lift, I suppose, um, at least on some level. Anyway, uh, let me share two little tidbits of news. Strength and muscle sport news. This first one uh, might be bad news for Phil and myself. It's from uh, Harvard Medical School. This is spanking new stuff from this month uh, from... Uh, Dr. Robert um, Schmerling, he's an MD, he's a faculty editor at Harvard Health Publications. Is it safe to take ibuprofen for the aches and pains of exercise? Um, Not long ago, he says, I took ibuprofen for a dental procedure. I was amazed how well it worked. Millions of people have had similar experiences with ibuprofen. Well, I can tell you I have, and Phil, I know you have, it's I have always considered it a good drug, right? It's It works for pain, like joint pain and things like that. And it's also potently anti-inflammatory if you take a good whopping, you know, six or 800 milligram dose of it. Uh, and that's the kind of thing where I've never liked uh, Tylenol, right, acetaminophen, because to me it's, it's weaker when it comes to the analgesic effects and it's not really anti-inflammatory. So I and it's incredibly liver and kidney toxic. So I don't know why yeah. I don't I just don't like acetaminophen. In fact, the label warnings on on Tylenol have become more and more severe over the decades. And we've talked about this before on the show, but there's a lot of animal studies uh Mike, I bet you've seen these too where they'll actually oh, yeah. damage the kidneys and the livers of rodents by giving them acetaminophen and then they'll see if a nutrient or some protective drug somehow reverses the damage but what always struck me is oh my god you're feeding them something that's an over-the-counter yeah, you know yeah. uh, item to purposely induce like well-known damager yeah. uh, you know of organs uh, and anyway yeah and when it comes to most lifting things a lot of them i would i would think are associated with inflammation so it's another reason why acetaminophen is just not high on my list but um here's here's what this is about he says NSAIDs right non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs um aspirin ibuprofen there's just a whole bunch of them um generally quite good but not risk free i think we know that uh, like I just had to have some stitches in my in my thigh, and I've been trying not to take too much aspirin um, because I don't want it to bleed, you know, that kind of stuff. But anyway, a new study of NSAID use during exercise. So it says it's really common with people that aches and pains during exercise. Um, this article focuses on endurance athletes, though, so we can compare this to ourselves, I suppose. Um, Many marathoners, of course, take NSAIDs to reduce pain, possibly even to improve performance, he says. Uh, However, those athletes may be at particular risk for kidney injury. Uh, Dehydration and muscle damage are common amongst endurance athletes, and that can contribute to kidney injury. Uh, If you add some of these NSAIDs to the mix, um, it might actually worsen the damage. So that's, again, this is the subject of a new study. It was published just this summer uh, in Emergency Medicine Journal. So they looked at 89 ultra-marathoners. Uh, over uh, several day, 155 mile race. Mike, I know you've experienced with those kinds of crazy guys. Oh yeah, they're nuts. Um, 
It says just over half of the NSAID takers had reduced kidney function, and only about a third of those in the placebo group did. Uh, now, I'd have to look into the statistical significance of this, but at least quantitatively, more of the people, I think, taking the ibuprofen uh, had uh, reduced kidney function or even kidney injury, according to this author. Uh, now, here are my thoughts about this. You've got to be very careful as someone who's looked at this with protein intake before. Uh, in fact, there's a new paper out that sort of corroborates some of the stuff that I was doing uh, three years ago about you know, how, what protein supposedly does or doesn't do to your kidneys. But in any case, you've got to be careful. One is kidney function, like how well they filter, GFR and whatnot. The other is actual kidney damage, and there's different little markers of that, like microalbumin and things like that. So I think we need to be careful about the filtration, the function versus actual damage. But in any case, it says, quote, unquote, injury in this study returned to normal uh, with no permanent detrimental effects, again, after the, the stress of the exercise and or ibuprofen. Um, finally, higher or lower doses of ibuprofen may have produced different results. It says, still, this study raises some serious concerns about taking ibuprofen during exercise, at least amongst endurance athletes. Now, this is where I cringe. The authors of this study suggested acetaminophen, like Tylenol, oh, no. as an alternative. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> so if... If you um, what was their rationale for that? That makes no sense. Uh, well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, the money they got from Tylenol, <laughs> <laughs> right? The study brought right. you by Tylenol. <laughs> well, I think that's the importance of having a, you know, a podcast with people you trust, maybe that do, that do interpret things, hopefully mostly correctly, um, because yeah, I, I think a lot of people have a lot of distrust of big pharma, and I think they should. You know, they're about managing disease, not curing it. You know, and and that kind of thing, and there's a lot of money involved. So um, they just say, bottom line, uh, if you're taking an NSAID regularly, you should have regular blood monitoring, uh, including measures of kidney function. So I don't know, a lot of simple measures like that may or may not fit the bill. I don't, they looked at like blood urea, nitrogen, or creatinine. Some of these things you gotta be careful as a lifter because you can have elevated creatinine if you're taking creatine powder oh, yeah. and then the doctor will say oh you have reduced kidney filtration because it's not clearing out all that creatinine it's like no i'm actually eating creatine which becomes creatinine so it's a rate of appearance thing because i'm swallowing it it's not reduced rate of disappearance because my kidneys are slow anyway so yeah i'm not going to change my ibuprofen practices from that you know um i got in a, a little discussion with my family vet actually and she was saying oh no it's well known that ibuprofen is hard on your kidneys and liver and i'm thinking are you confusing that with tylenol because i haven't heard a ton of this before so well, and i usually hear NSAIDs with uh stomach issues sometimes too in higher doses yeah bleeds gastric bleeds mm -hmm. and stuff yeah yeah yeah, and I think that's par for the course. I think anytime you take a, a good whopping dose of ibuprofen or aspirin, there's going to be a little bit of uh, what I would consider mild bleeding in your GI tract. That's just something yeah. that happens with that. But the, to me, the benefits outweigh the, the risks. But, Phil, I haven't even checked in with you much on this since with, with all the hip repairs and everything else. Are you, are you synthetic enough these days that you take less ibuprofen or no? Yeah, the only time I take it on is on Saturdays. So that's it. Um what goes on Saturday? Uh, that's my big heavy <laughs> squat, and I do all my squatting and all my deadlifting on one day now. Oh mm. wow! So, uh, and that's it for the whole week. So I'll take I'll take eight hundred milligrams before that, about mm -hmm. an, hour, an hour before, uh, and that's it. So I definitely don't live on it like I used to. Yeah, but, I gotta uh, think that helps. It just helps. I mean, there's there's still I have a slight bit of discomfort in the hip and things like that on the squats, and it you know, helps with that a bit, but. Right. What I like about it is it's not going to mask anything. And, you know, it's not an opiate. So it's not like you're going to be completely oblivious yeah. to, yeah. oh, something's going on with my hip and, you know, I don't want it to separate on me or something. And yeah. it's not going to mask it to that extent. Mm. You know, I once had a bioprof. He used to say that um, a lot of these over the counter pain meds, they, they don't mask pain. They just make it bother you less, in mm. a sense. You know, made, made sense mm. to me. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's it. And I, and I even like my people that are like, oh, this this hurts. Like, okay, well, and usually it's an inflammation issue. Yep. It's just explaining that to them. Don't take one 
<laughs> go take four. Go take eight hundred milligram and do that once, maybe twice, and then stop. It's what I, what I don't want to see with any of it is long term chronic use. It's like blast it and then get off of it. Try to get rid of the issue. You know, mm-hmm. Get that inflammation under check and then don't take anymore. Yep. You know, I think the biggest issue you've seen is with extended use. Oh uh, yeah. People popping it all day every day. So. Yeah. With uh, turmeric and I know you've done research on fish oils and that kind of stuff too. Yeah, honestly, yeah, turmeric, fish oils, I take a lot of that kind of stuff anyway because of the low grade. I mean, inflammation's getting blamed for everything from, you know, body yeah. fatness and obesity and diabetes and amyloid plaques in your brain and so many different things seem to be connected to it. So, I think a, a generally anti-inflammatory diet that's maybe a little lower on the carbs, you know, more rich in some of these uh harder to get nutrients like omega 3s or yeah even the herbal stuff like some curcumin um you know i i just try to play the odds with the curcumin thing i know it has low bioavailability but i'll get stuff from the now company and i'm not yeah. really in bed with them in any way just they have a couple that are supposed to be more bioavailable one's more, more a liposome type approach the other one is i don't know it's cyclodextrin or something else but or that you know the the bioparin or bioparin whatever they try to mix it with different things so you can actually absorb it better. Um, I was talking to the, the physician who put the stitches in my leg um, this past week, and um, she's really into curcumin. And she was asking me, she's like, "Well, I just eat it with a bunch of fat." I'm like, "Well, that's probably a step in the right direction, I imagine." Yeah, you that know. can help absorption too. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so no, it's a good point that you could do what you can, but it's. To me, ibuprofen is a lot like coffee. You know, it's more yeah. of an acute thing. You hit it hard, and then oh, you, definitely. yeah, and then you go tear it up in the gym a little bit. I mean, in a good way, performance-wise, and then, um, yeah. So, and, and the other stuff, I don't want anybody thinking they could take cur- curcumin or certainly fish oils, and have any kind of immediate effect. That's not just that's not how it's really going to work for you. I don't think so. Okay, um, I'm going to save this last study until after break. Um, Mike, there was one thing we were talking about before we started recording about um, cannabinoids in food products. Do you have that? Yeah, in front of you? <clears throat> yeah it's pretty interesting. This is from the uh, IFT website. So, as listeners know, Lonnie and I and a couple other people were out at the IFT conference in Vegas, which was much more on food technology than it was actually on nutrition. So, you can go back and yeah. listen to that uh, broadcast. Um, This one's from August 3rd, 2017, uh, bringing food science into the cannabis hemp edibles conversation. Um, So it's pretty interesting, the one they're talking about here, they said in January 2018, California will be joining the states where recreational cannabis is legalized. 21% of the U.S. population uh, will be able to consume edible cannabis products legally. So, mm. in fact, in one in five adults, they theorize, will be able to purchase different types of edibles. So they're now suspecting that this is going to be a <clears throat> massive area in the food sector. They said that one of the managing partner at one of the firms here uh, says currently supplying more than 40 million servings a year with an outlook to produce 600 million servings or more by 2021. So pretty massive growth in that area. So it'll be interesting Uh, as you start to see these things hit the market for different reasons. um, Yeah, it's just sort of thematic with our topic, right? Which is about the appetite and things like that. Because yeah, over I could tell you over the last thirty plus years, there's never been a good appetite booster uh, as far as a dietary supplement goes. You know, so. yeah, it, it could be a real godsend for sort of the hard gainer, thin guys who just, they can't seem to eat enough. I know that's not the same problem that everybody has, but um, yeah. I mean, if you get yourself in a, a, a good hard training program and you're in a stimulating muscle protein synthesis and that's your weak link, yeah, I'm really looking forward to see where some of this this goes, especially the way they can manipulate the, the individual chemicals and things like that and try to get specific effects you know. Oh yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. So I was out in Hood River for uh, two weeks in July, and it's legal there. So you, it's pretty interesting. You walk into the store, they check your ID, and it's 
like the one place we walked into was all literally organic. It was all locally raised for the most part. There was some stuff that was from different areas. And it was very fascinating that it's much an extreme science now. They can tell you, like, uh, according to the law in Oregon, all the, the edible products have to be tested. They have to list the chemical analysis on the back. They have to be breakable into, like, five milligram doses. Um, so it was pretty fascinating about all the work and everything that's been done and how hyper-specific you can get now with different ones and different types of ingestion and different blends and... Um, I think a lot of times if you you know, grew up with it being illegal most of your life, you just kind of think, oh, yeah, this guy bought it from God knows where and who knows what it is. And it's uh, much more regulated now, which I think is a good thing. Yep. You know, it'll be interesting to see uh, when I put different tags on the show. We'll see if YouTube bans this. I'll put cannabinoid <laughs> in one of our topics. I won't put pot or marijuana or drug. I'll put cannabinoid, and we'll see if they still flag it. It's, it, it's <laughs> like Phil and I were kind of talking about this the other week. It's just it's just such bullshit. Like you can't even have an academic, rational discussion about something that's in the news like this. You know, and, and I mean, banning isn't the right word, but they send me nasty stuff about you can't monetize this and it's too edgy. And well, okay, I guess everybody just be ignorant. <laughs> Whatever, wow. and that's that's the whole problem too. Because I know a researcher was looking at to run a study just on uh, CBD years ago. So cannabidiol, which you know for the most part isn't really psychoactive at all, you can buy it as an over-the-counter uh, supplement. But because I think the legal limit is 0.3 percent THC, you have to be below that. Some of the regulatory bodies were saying at the university, well, there's still THC in there, so now you have to file for a separate DEA license and go through all this other coup popping when the reality is anyone now can just walk into a store and buy it. You know, So it's, mm -hmm. I think it just becomes really hard to try to get more science on it. And you know, even other things that probably shouldn't be, you know, even steroids fall into the same thing, psychedelics, all that kind of stuff. Just because of the way they're scheduled, I would agree, not correctly, trying to get any actual research science on it makes it just a freaking nightmare of paper and logistics. Oh, I was listening to Science Friday years ago, and there was a guy on there. Uh, unfortunately, the two people they had were the extremes of the spectrum. So the one guy who was very <laughs> pro-research, he was kind of a hippie. You know, kind of hippy dippy, yeah. super duper liberal, and the other person with this arch conservative, like super <laughs> anal. You know, shame on you. You're, you know, and they kind of got in an argument, and I just thought you could have brought on some more reasonable <laughs> people from both <laughs> yeah. ends of the spectrum because maybe they did that on purpose because controversy sells. Oh yeah. You know, and it's always the people at the extremes that are the most vocal. You know, but um, it was interesting to your point that. It does seem to make it hard because of the federal uh, outlook on anything that's cannabis. Then they they don't even want to study it. Like they'll destroy their career or something. It's science is supposed to not be like that, right? Which is neutral, objective, careful, and controlled, and not being sucked into the politics of something. But whatever. Yeah. And that's the catch twenty two, then, right? Because then people cry, "Well, we don't know much about this compound." It's like, well. Because you haven't been able to study it, so we don't know good, bad, indifferent, mm -hmm. or anything else. So it's, yeah, and you can go down the whole big pharma conspiracy rabbit holes and all sorts of stuff. It's too. true. <laughs> I, I believe there's only one major supplier for research grade uh, marijuana type, um, you know, yeah, uh, materials. I believe it's in Mississippi, and from what I've heard, just through the grapevine from certain researchers, that. The quality is just horrible. <laughs> oh, I hadn't heard that. Mm. Uh, because it's one area, because it's still technically federally illegal, then the government has to say, okay, we have to control the supply of where you get it from, so it's this one place, which to me doesn't make any other sense, right? You should just leverage the private economy, have it you know, independently tested if you're going to use it in a study, and you're done, right? I mean, that just, I don't know, just seems so much easier. Right. I mean, think about the different raw material suppliers for dietary supplements. They can come from yeah. various places. You just, yeah, HPLC, yeah. test them for uh, content yeah, and exactly. purity. Yeah. Near infrared, whatever they're using these days. Okay, we're going to go to break, and then I've got some questions uh, for both of you guys. Uh, and we'll try to share what we know a little bit about manipulation of 
Appetite for Gain and Loss. Hey listeners, this is Dr. Lonnie Lowry. If you've ever had anyone critique you uh, on your protein intake as part of your weightlifting lifestyle, oh, you poor meathead, all that extra protein is going to rot your kidneys or weaken your bones or dehydrate you or give you gout or who knows what. Uh, there is a book available. You could simply Google CRC Press and Lowry. And what I've done is reach out to experts all over the world and create a book, a single compendium that you can hold up and say, this is why I consume extra protein. This can be very valuable when you're um, being quote unquote educated uh, by various professionals on the topic. Uh, there's an enormous amount of literature in this book on the safety, uh, the effectiveness, how protein works in cells, the history of protein and weight trainers, uh, much more. So again, please check out CRC Press and Protein and Lowry. You can just Google that. And uh, I do, full disclosure, I do make a small single digit royalty on the book. But that's not why I did it. I did it so we can all have something, uh, our particular population, uh, to both defend what we do and to inform our nutrition and our eating. Thanks. Iron Radio is, of course, primarily a podcast. But over the years, there have been technical glitches calling for backup streaming and listeners who wanted the convenience of other sources of audio content. Toward this end, Iron Radio is now simulcast and backed up on YouTube. If needed, please search Lawnman07 or Iron Radio from within YouTube. There's not much video, but if you like to listen through YouTube on a Roku or other living room device, there you go. Like your weekly fix of Iron Radio? In addition to being a popular institute on iTunes, we are also on email. Simply go to www.ironradio.org and sign up for the voluntary email. You'll get a once per week email, no more, that's little more than the show notes and a link to the audio. So go for it. All right, folks, we're back. It's uh, Phil and Lonnie and Mike, and we're going to talk about manipulating your appetite uh, for gain and loss. Uh, some of this stemmed from a paper, an academic paper that Joe Shalero sent me. He was recently on, um, mental health advocate and uh, a key player uh, down in mid-Ohio and like mental health and being a, a proponent of that and whatnot. But he sent me one from Frontiers in Psychology. It's, um, the title is Orexin A Controls Sympathetic Activity and Eating Behavior. This is by uh, Giovanni Messina and colleagues. Looks like it's an Italian study. Um, before I get into that, let, let me offer a couple of quick definitions for everybody. Um, one, uh, hunger and appetite tend to be different things, right? So if you're not familiar, hunger is something that's generally considered more biological right? You're weak, you're shaky, your stomach is growling, your blood sugar is low, things like that. Whereas appetite is generally considered, uh, and we can have a psych person on to, you know, dig through the nuances, I suppose, in the future, but appetite being more psychological, right? Like we have, for many years, we had a bread baking factory for the Schwabels Bread Company to here in my town. And hot damn, even if I just ate, you drive by the factory and the smell of baking bread, you're like, oh mm -hmm. man, you know, Especially, I, I pity the fool in my town who was on a low-carb <laughs> diet, you know. So, hunger more biological, appetite maybe more psychological. It's also worth defining, I think, the term orexin. So, a lot of people are familiar with the term anorexia, right? Lack of desire to eat. But orexia would be uh, sort of a suffix on a word that means desire to eat, like appetite, hunger, you know, that kind of stuff. So let me set the stage with some of this, and then we'll go down some ways to boost your appetite or suppress your appetite, like real ways to do this, not hokey dietary supplements that are nothing but a collection of B vitamins or whatnot. But um, set the stage with this paper. The hypothalamus integrates nutritional information derived from all peripheral organs. 
This region of the brain controls hormonal secretions and neural pathways, uh, etc. Orexin A is a hypothalamic neuropeptide involved in the regulation of feeding behavior as well as sleep wakefulness rhythm uh, and different neuroendocrine types of uh, homeostasis. This neuropeptide is involved in the control of, this, of sympathetic activation, right? So your fight or flight sort of uh, nervous system, blood pressure, metabolic status, and blood glucose level. So this is a mini review that talks about both the effects of this neuropeptide on hunger and appetite, but also on energy expenditure, right? So that's important too. I mean, your resting energy expenditure is what, 65 maybe? percent of all your calorie output every day so things that change your resting metabolic rate have a big impact on your body weight and fatness and so again kind of a mini review about this um, thermoregulatory hypothesis that you might have these neuropeptides that drive your metabolic rate and they also affect your appetite um, it just talks about how um, the hypothalamus initiates appropriate behavioral and metabolic responses controls glucose use in insulin sensitive organs such as skeletal muscle and it also affects whole body energy metabolism so it goes on to say orexins promote both arousal and feeding so there's there's a complex system of this I don't want to like explore the whole paper it's not a brand new paper it's just interesting because it looks at mechanisms here uh, I think this was like a, a 2014 paper but there's some nice things in here for, in this article uh, about what all orexins affect you know, again food intake energy expenditure blood sugar control different hormonal changes like insulin and glucagon right the things that drive your blood sugar either down or up um, autonomic function your state of arousal uh, things like that so uh, it talks about how these things there's different aspects to this and and there's a time course of how they go up and down like in response to fasting and things like that uh, it does say it has been demonstrated that orexins play a role in sleep regulation as well. Deficiency in orexin neurotransmission results in sleep disorder narcolepsy in mice, dogs, and humans. So um, also is associated with an increase in body mass index, I'm assuming not in a good way, and higher risk of type 2 diabetes. So it looks like this whole paper just, again, it focuses on this, the role of orexins along with all the other things that drive eating behavior. There's a figure in here that talks about body temperature, sympathetic activity, right? So think about like a adrenaline response and fight or flight, your blood sugar levels, blood glucose levels, all these things influencing eating behavior. Uh, it says it has been proved that orexins affect plasma lipoprotein profile and insulin glucose homeostasis. Uh, orexins stimulate insulin release from the pancreas. It says there's also a strong correlation between low plasma orexin and obesity. Uh, in summary, there is substantial evidence in the literature that helps to define the physiological role of orexin neurons and their various connections. So again, there's lots of things that drive both metabolic rate and how it connects with your eating behaviors. Um, so I've got a couple of questions here for you guys on appetite boosting and appetite suppression. So again, after we wade through some definitions and some of that um, mechanistic <coughs> stuff. Um, Mike, you just talked about cannabinoids in food products and things like that. So one of my first questions, uh, let's start with Phil. Would you do that if they came out with something and it was specifically a cannabinoid-based appetite stimulant? Would you be about that? Would you try that? Yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd give it a shot. I would think I would too. Yeah, honestly, yeah. Uh, especially if they can tease apart some of the, you know, psychedelic effects from the, you know, yeah. from the appetite stuff. Um, I know it, it's one of those things. Like, there's a lot of healthcare industry in Northeast Ohio here where I am, and they, they'll let people go. Even the local city employer here, like, if you have nicotine in your blood, I think they'll fire you. I, and I'm like, oh my god! And imagine if you're doing this. So you're, like, you're yeah. somehow you test positive. You're like, I don't know. It was legal. It was an appetite stimulant. There's, I'm not mm. sitting around getting high. I, I don't know. What about you, Mike? Would you do it? Would you try some of this stuff? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think we're getting to the point now where we have a much better understanding of it. Um, I just pulled up a 
a study. There's a couple studies now, one of them even going back to uh, 2009 about cannabinoids and appetite. I know that the pharmaceutical company is they've tried to recreate that too for cachexic patients and you know people that are losing weight. Um, from what I've heard of people that have used that, the natural or I should say the legal pharma compounds aren't nearly as effective. Um, so yeah, I think it'd be be worth a shot. We know more about that than we know about a lot of other things. So right, yeah. Like I said, there really hasn't been, in my opinion, um, a good dietary supplement over-the-counter approach uh, no. to boosting appetite. The the supplements, like I said, they're just they're random collections of some vitamins or whatnot, hardly different from a multi. You know, mm. and and what, I don't care what they're marketed as. I'm not wasting my money on that stuff. At least not with the delusion that it's going to make me hungry. You know. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Other topics here with the appetite boosting. Let's stick with this half of the equation here. Um, there are some things that I think people could do. One would be consuming fast-acting, right, high glycemic carbs, like a gram per kg. I don't know, maybe a little over half a gram per pound to purposely swing your blood sugar a little bit, right? In a lot of weight control settings, weight, you know, loss, fat loss settings, you don't have people eating stuff like rice krispies and cornflakes and stuff mm -hmm. like that, but. Uh, th this would be the time I would think it might be good to do that because 90 minutes later, your blood sugar has uh, it's spiked early on, like at 30 minutes. 90 minutes later, certainly 120 minutes later, it's back down probably below where you started. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're, you're hungry, man. And, I mean, throw 20 to 40 grams of something like fast, like a whey protein in with that. Man, you want to eat six times a day? I bet that's going to help, right? Yeah. I mean, you're purposely doing it. Phil... And there's only one other thing I have on this list, which we discussed a few weeks ago, which was the sodium content. Higher sodium diet seemed to increase appetite 20 to 30 percent, which is which is interesting. Uh, there's some potential scary things with on the muscle component with this, however. But um, what do you do? I mean, I know you know how to gain weight, brother. How do you how do you go? How do you go about it? It's like going down. I mean, that's like going up, going down. I mean, going up, you guys just got to eat. And going down, you gotta not eat. Part of it's just <laughs> part of it's realizing that okay, this is gonna suck to an extent, mm -hmm. you know. And that's just it. and that's usually the part that nobody wants to get past. Well, I'm not hungry. Well, shut up. You know, <laughs> eat. <laughs> Some, you have to do that. Um, another thing that I've noticed is hydration. If yeah. somebody stays hydrated, it's like they digest faster. They get hungry faster. Hmm. If you got somebody that's that's hmm. under hydrated. Uh, I found that you know a lot of times it's like stuff sticks around longer. If you get some water and things like that, their their digestive tract seems to clear faster. I don't have any uh, any science behind that, mm -hmm. just practical use. But I mean, adding a little more water and this and that, and it's it's like the the pipes just clear uh, is is what it seems. Well, I could and add that... a little to that. I know I've actually looked at the concentration of a fluid is related to how fast it empties your stomach, right? So more dilute yeah. things have faster gastric emptying. So to your point, if you're gonna rinse down almost everything you're swallowing with water uh, and plenty of it, it probably would help with gastric emptying, the speed of it, you know? Um, and other than that, I mean, like I said, at a certain point to be, to be, how do we say, less than average or more than average, it's gonna be work. You know, it's like anybody that says, well, I'm hungry, I'm, I'm down a diet. Well, yeah, you're going down, dummy. You're, gonna be, <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're trying to get to 8% body fat. Oh, sorry, you're going to be hungry. You know, <laughs> you're <you know>. so blunt. <laughs> and if you're trying to be 350 pounds, there's, there's going to be times that you just don't want to eat. Yep. And you know what? You have to. Yeah. Uh, it's just part of the part of the job. You know, there's, there's times that I don't want to. You know, being I'm up to two... I'm about 265, 267 now, and this is where things are going to get ugly, you know, because I'm going to try and be 280 by November. Mm -hmm. So I can stay here and just eat a lot. To get to 280, it gets stupid. And you know, yeah. I, just, I just know that's going to happen, and it's going to be a lot of what you said. There's going to be a lot more simple things added in between the real stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, crackers and cookies and, you know, chips and yeah. things that just don't stick around long. You know, go to the Chinese buffet. An hour later, you're hungry again. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, no, right? Yeah. Like 
You're right. On some level, it is. It's not just about appetite again, desire, you know, yeah. orexia, a desire to eat. But it's suck it up, Buttercup. You know, I used to have some football players. They'd come to me and they'd be like, uh, Doc, I'm not hungry. I'm like, I don't care. You know, set your alarm yeah. clock. You know, set your little uh, phone timer. And every two hours, it's time to eat. Now, I don't want you to eat yeah. till you throw up. That's stupid. I don't want you to get sick. Yes. But you know, if you want to be a bigger man, you have to eat like a bigger man. And your homeostasis, every hormone and neuropeptide and enzyme in your body is built to sort of keep you where you are. So it's time to um, have another bowl. <laughs> and I mean, I'm actually a, a really big fan of things like salads and things like that. But I know when I'm going up, I just can't do it because then I'm going to be so full so long. Right. That I just can't. I yeah. have to skip those things for now. No room <laughs> for it. Yeah. Um, and I have more potatoes and things like that, things that don't stick around as long. So, yeah. 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 You mentioned a good point about playing around with the volumes of food. Um, I've done that a lot with people both going up and going down. <clears throat> so that's what I did years ago. So I started off at 156 pounds. So I remember bringing my little cooler to work when I was doing my internship and I had <clears throat> my three normal meals and then I had my two shakes that I put, I don't know, some ungodly weird weight, <laughs> weight gainer into. Um, but, you know, drinking something between meals, I could do that. But if you asked me to eat a whole nother meal in between the meals I was already eating, I was like, oh, my God, you know, it was just uh, horrendous. Um, and then on the mm -hmm. flip side, like you mentioned, Phil, you can do the opposite, right? So if you're trying to cut back, you're looking at the density of your food, right? Mm -hmm. Just like training in the gym. So can I eat things that have a lot of fiber but are not really calorically that mm -hmm. dense, right? So lots of veggies and things like that. And you can then use that almost the inverse of that too as you go up. So I'll have people take things that are super high in micronutrition and then blend them up but keep the volume relatively low. So like you said, Phil, it's you know, when you're trying to eat that much food, you know, to sit down and eat a bowl of a salad that has like 200 calories, you're like, mm -hmm. this is not helping me. But yeah. if you take part of that and you throw it in a blender and you use a small amount of liquid, yeah, now you can get a lot more higher micronutrition at a small volume and it's a little bit more palatable and you can still have more room to add all the other things into. Yeah, that's why I like dried fruits, you know, um, yeah. because they're just they get the so much of the they just it's just concentrated you know all the micronutrients vitamins minerals phytochemicals and stuff like that or handfuls of nuts and full fat granola we've talked about a lot of this stuff before i i think one of the things some people need to be careful with in the weightlifting community is we're so focused on protein all the time. If there's a downside to really high protein diets, yeah. it's not that they hurt your kidneys, right, or whatever, or whatever they think it does your bones, or but it's it's that it's very satiating. It's very filling. Um, now you can use that to your advantage if you're going down, if you're trying to suppress your appetite, right? You know, go with meats and casein that clots in your stomach, slow acting stuff. But when you're trying to gain. Um, I really don't think people should be going over a gram per pound. That's a surplus for almost everybody, especially when you're in a huge calorie surplus. Yeah, you're in a calorie surplus too. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, it's a common thing I think we've all heard. Oh, hey, coach. Hey, doc. I, I'm, um, I'm eating like 300 grams of protein a day. I can't make any gains. What's the matter? I'm like, well, because you're eating yeah. 300 grams of protein a day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. And like, like, we've talked about it before. I mean, my constant variable as far as diet is my protein. If there's no reason for that to really change. Yeah, so, I think that's pretty true. A lot of what changes is the density of things like that. When I'm when I was going down, it was lots of chicken breasts and very lean ham and things like that. Now it flops the other way. Now it's ribeye steaks and things with higher fat content. Mm -hmm. You know, so I get more bang for my buck. A lot more. You know, it's easy for me every time I cross through the kitchen to grab a handful of nuts and things like that. And there's a couple hundred calories just walking past. You know, you're just constantly <laughs> grabbing little things like that that just have a lot of bang, um, and it adds up. Every time I drive to the gym, I stop by the little grocery store down there, and I grab these two little things of, like trail mix for 50 cents each, and they're, there's 500 calories. It takes yep. me two minutes to get them in. Yep. You know? you know, it's all about density, like Mike was saying. Yeah. How many calories you know, per volume <clears throat> can you cram in there? I, actually, Phil, you said something, which it just, it sounds counterintuitive to the gen pop, but I think a lot of us in the know are kind of, you know, nodding our heads, but you were saying that you don't always just go for like, for example, the burger, but actually 
some of the mayo rich slathered little yeah. cheap ass chicken sandwiches you can buy at fast food restaurants <laughs> yeah. are you know fairly easily digested soft wolf them down and they actually have more calories than the beef products right yeah and that was actually a funny thing like when i lived out in california and we were getting ready for that meat that i just ate hundred missed eight hundred we, me and my wife would pull up the drive throughs and they were like the first state to adopt that deal where they had to have like the calorie content on the menu. Oh. Mm. And it was wonderful. I could pick out like, I get 700 calories for a <laughs> dollar. Yeah. You know? Reverse. <laughs> yeah, in reverse <laughs> of what they want. Which, yeah, I didn't, I was like, I wasn't looking at the item. I was looking at dollars per calories. And I was like, <laughs> I'm taking that. There it is. There's the calories right there. And it only <laughs> costs a dollar. It's uh, so. twisted. Yeah. It's funny because, yeah, it's, it's you, you have the opposite goal. No. Your goal is weight gain. Yeah. Not weight loss. That's funny. Yeah, there's a great book on that too that uh, Rob Wolf has out called Wired to Eat. Um, Stephen Guy has got a similar book out too, and they're both super knowledgeable in that area. And one of the things Rob talks about that you see in competitive eating competitions is they'll start mixing another type of food in, right? Or if you've everyone's watched the the man versus food type thing, and he'll you know trying to finish some huge massive sundae and he'll order a side of fries you're going what the that doesn't make any sense why you're adding more food but it's there's some data to show that combining different sensations right to eliminate that sort of taste fatigue uh, i don't want to eat anything more sweet but oh i eat something salty okay Ooh, now i, I can eat more of the sweet thing again oh yeah um, and you you find that even historically as much as i i think it can be improved the uh, old school cutting bodybuilding diet of you know broccoli and chicken and that kind of stuff i think there may be something to from a taste perspective possibly maybe limiting the amount of foods that you eat i don't agree with that from a mm. micronutrition standpoint or other reasons um, but one thing i have done with people is just pay attention to what foods tend to make them hungrier versus not hungrier and then obviously the other one i've noticed a lot more lately is exercise so what I've done with a few people and done with myself is uh, paradoxically cut way back on their higher intensity exercise. I mean, they're still doing some and then take a period of time and just be more hyper aggressive of lowering their calories. Mm -hmm. And then once they come out of that, then we just kind of work to stabilize it again. And that anecdotally so far seems to work pretty good. So I've noticed some people when they exercise at higher intensity, their appetite goes up pretty substantially. Um, other people not quite as much, but if you can kind of moderate the level of exercise, you know, have them do more neat, do more low intensity walks, some low intensity cardio, obviously don't get, you know, crazy stupid and do two to three hours a day and not lift and that kind of thing. But I think there's some interesting things there where you're, it allows them, it seems like to do a lower calorie for a period of time and, and not feel as just horrible. Mm hmm no, oh, I agree. Training definitely has a play. I mean, I, there's several different training variations that I do, and I just know, okay, these people are going to be ravenous when they're mm -hmm. doing this program, and it happens every time. Like, once we really up the squat volume and things like that, so that's what they always report back. Like, yeah. I do can't stop the, eating. <laughs> the higher <laughs> intensity volume, at least that's what I find. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, yeah. and like, like when we get to meat prep stuff for powerlifters, when the volume's way low and it's heavy, they're not hungry. Yeah, you know, they're just yeah. it's 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 that lots of volume in that seventy percent range, and yep. then they're just they're just ready to eat their own house. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I you know I think it's a lot of that is like glycogen depression. You know, mm -hmm. the, you sure. burn through all your stored carbohydrate, yeah. and your body's like, oh my, because of course that's more short term control. Mm -hmm. You know, as far as uh, appetite goes and that kind of stuff, it, the literature is really interesting on that too. Because when people go from off season to on season training. So much, yeah, I think it depends on the type of training. I think there's a probably, this is just experiential, but I think there's a lot of individual differences. But the, uh, the literature that I've looked at says you don't automatically get hungry simply because, like, a, you're in a team sport and you go from off-season to on-season. You know, like, uh, you, you start your training program. You, don't, you can't just bank on the fact that you're going to be starving. Mm -hmm. But it does seem to me, yeah, like the stuff with the weight training, especially with enough volume, yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's going to make you. I, I think it makes people hungry. I mean, you're you're it, that should make sense if your if your biological yeah. system is working, you're stimulating synthesis. Well, what are you going to synthesize? You need some building blocks, you know. Yeah. Well, and it's only smart. I mean, like I only throw the that type of stuff at people that are okay. I'm ready to gain. 
You know, yeah. I'm not going to, like, oh, I want to go down. Great. We're going to throw all this at you while you're dieting. <laughs> it just makes no sense. Good you luck know, with you all need that. The, you need the fuel literally to recover, not only and to, to you know, gain weight. But, you know, if somebody's dieting down, I tend to lower their amount of really hard training. Yeah. Um, and like you said, make them walk. Go walk. Go do that stuff. That stuff burns without mm-hmm. knocking you down. So Yeah. Yeah, without r- rifling through all your carb stores and yeah. stuff like that. So, um, Question well, here, just a couple real quick from Facebook LAN. Sweet. Uh, it says, how much of your daily hunger signals are due to spikes and drops in blood sugar slash insulin? <laughs> For example, if you eat a large amount of food close to bedtime, are you more likely to wake up with ravenous hunger than you would have had if you had your last meal three to four hours before sleeping? Uh, Professionals often relate hunger to increased metabolism, but is hunger in the average person more likely due to the rebound of high insulin production? I guess that's the actual question. You want to take a shot at that initially, Lonnie? Uh, Well, I think... (laughs) Yeah, that's it's a good question. I'm just laughing because it's it gets super down in the weeds pretty fast. Yeah, no, yeah, it does. Especially because when you if you read the literature, the diurnal effects of stuff like diabetes and stuff, you know, they might be instructed to eat something before bed because it's going to have one effect right. on the next morning. That might not be true. In fact, it might be the opposite in some ways of someone who does not have diabetes. You know, so it's actually hard to interpret some of the literature uh, about that. I think one of the best things you can do is pick out a schedule that you think is good for you. You know, is it eating five times a day? Is it eating three or four huge meals? Whatever it might be. I think homeostasis ruins a lot of these nuances. You know, people have Mm -hmm. too much detail in their plans, and your body's going to compensate and adjust in different ways. And it's actually hard to fool Mother Nature in a lot of ways. So as far as eating something right before bed or not, um, I think if I was in a weight gain phase, I I would not be avoiding food in that couple hours before bed. I would still eat, you know, at least get my slow acting proteins and stuff like that. Um, carbohydrate metabolism isn't stellar late in the day compared to earlier in the day for a couple of different reasons: insulin secretion is lower, muscle activity is lower. Uh, but again, if I was trying to gain weight, I, I, to hell with all this stuff. I'm just going to try to, you know, if that's my fourth meal of the day or my fifth meal. I'm just going to go for it with the energy, you know, rich foods like we were talking about and stuff like that. Um, I don't know. I would generally agree with that. I mean, I think in the healthy person, what I like them to do is, you know, most of the time, right? So if they're trying to gain weight, their meal frequency is probably going to be a little bit higher. Obviously, they're going to eat more higher caloric foods, things of that nature. Um, But even in that scenario, I still want to see some type of variability. So I may play mm-hmm. around with them skipping breakfast once in a while. Um, I've done stuff like they would do a longer 18 to 24 hour fast, but only once every like three weeks, you know, so not enough to give them that really negative caloric intake because they're looking to gain, but maybe enough to, you know, kind of pull everything back, maybe make sure their baseline insulin and glucose doesn't go completely haywire and that type of thing too. Um, and if they can't do variability then i'm thinking there may be something kind of off on that right so if you you mentioned like uh, type 2 diabetics so one thing that happens with them is they become very metabolically inflexible they start losing the ability to use carbohydrate metabolism but then their insulin level keeps going up and up and that over time actually screws with their body's ability to use fat also so i think part of that is that they can't really when they're resting switch over to another fuel source so they become very sensitive to changes in uh, especially glucose and that type of thing too so yeah um just quickly here's what i was referring to with the diabetics literature um the somagi effect um chronic Hmm. somagi rebound is a contested explanation of a phenomenon of elevated blood sugars in the morning also called the somagi effect uh, and post hypoglycemic hyperglycemia it is a rebounding high blood sugar that is a response to low blood sugar and again, you have to be careful trying to interpret these things. That's all I'm going to tell people. I don't want to go into anything much deeper than that. But um, I like what you said, though, about keeping your metabolism on its toes in a sense. It's sort of like what you, you're, the same thing that, that's true with you, what you said about taste and really so mm-hmm. many things, which is you don't want to desensitize. So right. but by providing different stimuli on occasion, you know, um, yeah, you keep your metabolism on its toes. 
Yeah, so that's a good question. That's a, It's a chewy one. Like you said, it gets d- down in the weeds pretty fast. But, uh, uh, you know, a lot of this, I think, is also uh, how this meshes with your personal lifestyles and rhythms and your ske- work schedule and your family. And, you know, there's a lot of, like, the whole biopsychosocial spectrum to all this, too. Cool. And we got one last one here. That was for Tommy Codwell. So thank you very much for that. That was a good question. Uh, this one's from Nick Deacon. Examples of times you should not listen to your appetite, internal cue, and revert to external cue, such as tracking or reasons for the opposite. Um, I guess my thoughts on that initially are looking at what direction you're going. So I like to have people go as far as they can on their own sort of internal cues. So like Phil was saying too, is that if you're looking to gain weight, you know, just you know, eat when you're hungry to start, you know, and then maybe eat a little bit more in between and just kind of see how far you can go on that and we'll track your results and that type of thing. And then if we find that you've kind of plateaued, yeah, then I may say, okay, let's do a three day nutrition log. Let's look at what's going on. Maybe log more protein, maybe start logging some other things uh, just to try to increase that level of awareness. And I'll do the same thing going the way back down. Um, you know, and for a lot of people, I do have them track a fair amount just because that keeps them on task. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I worked with a fitness competitor and she was in the off season, but was still staying very lean. Uh, she emailed me a while ago and said that she hasn't tracked her food at all now for four months and she's at the same body composition. Uh, so for her, that was like a huge win because she's been very used to and very successful at Uh, tracking everything and now she's been able to basically sort of reset for lack of a better word her internal cues and doesn't necessarily need to track everything to stay on target yeah yeah monitoring can be good um but yeah homeostasis people are remarkably good at eating a similar amount of food every day as far as internal external cues um yeah, you can manipulate your internal cues by eating something like high glycemic carbs like we talked about because then you, you're literally physically hungrier, you know, in a short time later. Uh, but there's also that flip side, you know, the whole suck it up buttercup side of things. Mm-hmm. And if you want to be a bigger person, you have to eat like a bigger person. Uh, honestly, there's some simple tricks that people can do instead of just going nuts. Like you said, drinking calories would be one, you know, um, different kinds of shakes and whatnot nutrient shakes um even stuff like switch to whole milk you know if you're normally drinking Mm -hmm. one or two percent or less uh eat a bagel for breakfast instead of a piece of toast you know there's a lot of ways that you can make simple swap outs for more energy rich you know calorie dense kinds of kinds of foods so yeah i find the super simple one like you said is a percentage of fat so if you're trying to gain, I'll have people use, you know, full fat yogurt as an example or yep. cottage cheese. Yep. And then as you're trying to, you know, go back down, then eh, let's drop to maybe 2%. You know, let's go non-fat. And it, it's one of those things because the volume is kind of staying about the same that they don't really notice too much of a difference. So you're kind of sneaking calories in and sneaking calories out as you've talked about. Yeah, like full fat granola instead of the, you know, the yeah. lighter stuff. Uh, a lot of us probably have different light products in our kitchens, whether we're seeking that specifically or not. There's, it's just all over the food supply, you know, the market. So, yeah, simple tricks like that. You can add or subtract quite a few hundred calories, actually, every day. So, you know, nice little. Um, let me wrap this up by saying we did not really, yeah. we didn't touch on the appetite suppression thing too much other than saying, you know, meat and casein probably are helpful for keeping you stay full. So ironically, yeah, a lot of people eat too much protein when they're trying to gain. Actually, like Phil said, keeping protein fairly steady, and let's, let's say, for example, around a gram per pound, um, that's the kind of stuff that it, it can actually be quite filling in a lot of ways. Again, casing clots in your stomach, whatnot. Soluble fiber, another good way to keep full, right? Forms of gel on your stomach and that sort of thing. Um, it's worth noting that a lot of, we are talking about orexins and, Uh, a sympathetic drive and that kind of stuff. A lot of things that kill your appetite, uh, again, we're talking about appetite suppression side of the equation now, would be uh, like a stimulant type thing, Um, like ephedra and ephedrine that were so popular throughout the, you know, 90s, for example, uh, early 2000s. Um, 
a lot of those stimulants, half of their weight loss effects were attributed to the um, the anorectic effects, right? Oh, the yeah. appetite killing. It wasn't j all metabolic boost. They those things did raise your metabolic rate. That's strong stuff. Um, and I, I imagine there are other like alternative stimulants on the market these days. I have yet to be impressed by anything the way that you know um, ephedra worked. I know people can still buy um, ephedra in different ways. You know, buy an ephedra plant and make your own tea or what have you. You have to be kind of careful. It is strong if you're prone to arrhythmias and that kind of stuff. You got to be careful. But the point is, a lot of the things that do, in fact, uh, kill your appetite are sympathetic in nature, sort of stimulant in nature. Uh, like those, you know, herbal preps, different kinds of adrenergic, you know, adrenaline-like um, compounds that you'll get in some of those herbs. But yeah, I wonder how much of that too is also the fact that when you're reducing your calories and you have that type of a heavy stimulant, you tend to move around a lot more too. So your neat doesn't tend to just plummet to nowhere. So I yeah, think that's that might be part of it too. We talked about monitoring when when you were uh, suggesting that before. I, I thought about that too. In weight loss settings, I love to have people track their movement, and it's so easy now. You know, we don't have yeah. to give you an accelerometer out of the lab. But if you really are cutting several hundred calories a day, let's say you know six hundred calories a day out of your diet because you're you're removing the full fat items or some of the you know you're putting a lot of fiber in whatever. I like to track weight loss clients in that way. Um, because they could inadvertently be moving much less. Again, homeostasis, your body's trying to stay the same size. So I, I, I don't know how much that would happen on the weight gain side, but it would be interesting to see to see that. You know, like basically just yeah. if you want to keep an, uh, an eye on your, uh, to Mike's point, the non-exercise uh, physical activity, that's the kind of stuff that you actually might be moving more or less. Your body's compensating on you and you don't even notice because you're like, well, I'm doing the same thing in the gym. Yeah, but that's only a fraction of your energy output every day. You know, yeah. so it's that another a big breakthrough thing. that I got from just wearables and Fitbits and all that kind of stuff was years ago, I started having clients track their step count, you know, so now instead of their step count going from, you know, 10,000 a day to 4,000 a day and they don't realize that that's what happened, you know, at least it's one more variable you can kind of look and see where it's at or try to hold that constant. So when you're really cutting calories, I can say, okay, let's really try to get, you know, 8,000 or 10,000 or whatever. So many steps per day that you're, you're trying to at least hold that variable up because, like you said, we know that's the one that's going to drop down and we know that it's going to happen usually unconsciously. The person's not going to know that they did it. Yes, right. Yep. Okay. Uh, quick reminder to everyone, uh, we do just Iron Radio type stuff here at the end. We do thank people who are supporting members. Um, check that out in the show notes on iTunes. Uh, and again, we are going to start fielding a few questions from Facebook um, or some of the Twitter accounts we have, like the Lawn Man 7, Mike T. Nelson. Um, there's an Iron Radio specific Twitter account now. So... Any one of these that you feel like firing a message, you know, um, we'll have to come up with a good hashtag for this stuff. But uh, we will kind of watch those and let you know the topic in advance. So maybe on Saturday morning or even a little bit earlier in the week, like Friday, uh, we'll let you know what the topic's going to be. And if you have a burning question, we can try to address it um, on air. Right. So. All right. Having Perfect. said that. Yeah, that's that is appetite manipulation for gain and loss we'll uh i guess we'll see everybody next time all right see you hey listeners have you seen the store at ironradio.org there are three halls in the store one for phil one for fortress and one for myself dr lowry and they're thematic. So you can go into our Halls of Iron store and choose based on your goal. If you need something to learn or read or something nutritional, you can look in my store, uh, Lonnie's store. If you want something about injury prevention uh, or competition, then take a look at Phil's Hall of Iron. And if you want something about motivation or daily training, Fortress's Hall has what you're looking for.
There are some fun, heroic descriptors uh, as you browse through the stores. We try to make it a little more fun than the average boring online store. And whether you're a novice lifter or someone more experienced, you can take heart that you're not wasting your time. The things that we put in each hall of iron are actually based on our own recommendations. Protein powders that we know to be good, uh, knee sleeves, wraps of some kind, things that Fortress uses in his own training. Uh, the stuff you, you see, you know is good. This way you don't waste time. So check out the Iron Radio store at ironradio.org and um, let us know what you think on the forums and certainly you can request products and we will uh, screen them before they go in. So thanks for listening. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding, um, please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org uh, store. Uh, we also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio Podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.